Hi everyone, I'm Jerry Schumann, pastor here at Ludlow Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that this video blesses and encourages you in your faith. And please consider sharing this on social media. Doing so is a strategic way that we're able to share the gospel with other people today. But before we begin, please keep this in mind. This video is not intended to be, and really it cannot be, a replacement for your commitment to a local church. God commands his people to gather regularly for worship and for fellowship under the leadership and the care of godly elders where the whole body is knit together and that's how the body grows and builds itself up in love. So nothing online can be a replacement for that. So if you're in the area, uh, come and join us for worship. We'd love to have you with us. If you're not nearby, please be sure that you are committed to a local, faithful, Bible-believing church. Thank you, and God bless. Father, your word says that we are to, with meekness, receive the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. And there, James is writing to believers. And so, Father, I pray that we be characterized by that meekness. Um, Father, we're thankful that in a world where there's so much shifting sand that we have a rock under our feet with the word of God that, that it, is, it is firm, it's sure, it's not up for vote, it is steadfast, no matter our situation, it leads us in the truth, and ultimately it leads us to Christ. Father, your word also calls us that we're not to be only hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And I know, Father, that as we're looking at this word today, that all of us um, will see that we have we have the improvement to grow in. Uh, maybe some of us need, um, we, we need your help. We need your grace in this area. So would your spirit be with us? Help me to be faithful to your word, to explain it faithfully. And I pray that you would be with all of us, that we would receive your word, and that we would be doers of it. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you have a copy of God's Word, I want to invite you to keep your Bible open to Exodus chapter 20. We'll be going in all sorts of different parts of the Bible today, but it's very helpful to be able to follow along and see, indeed, what does God's Word say. So we're continuing our study of the Ten Commandments, and today we're looking at the Fifth Commandment. And, and with this commandment, we are making a transition from the first four commandments that deal with our relationship to God, our duty to God, to the last six that deal with our duty to our fellow man. But as we're making this transition, remember that, that all of this is, it's all the same law. We're all in the Ten Commandments. We can distinguish the love of God and the love of man, but we can't separate them. You can distinguish them, but you can't separate them. They, they go together. So what, the, what that means is that no one can say in truth, I love God, but it's people I can't stand. We've heard that sort of thing before, but we can't say that in truth. Jesus would say, no, that's not true. That's not true. Uh, if, if we love God, we'll also love our fellow man. So as we begin the second table of the law, which focuses on our love of neighbor, we're not coming to an optional or an unimportant aspect of the law. These six commandments here, they hang together with the first four commandments. Now, children... I know you've been going through your catechism, and uh, I have a couple questions for you here. I see our children's here, Hewitt's children. Uh, I don't see Laney here today, but, um, or yep, there you are, Laney. All right, so Laney, you, you maybe have been going through this with your parents here today. So here's the first question for you kids, and I'll ask it, and then we can say it together, okay? The first question is, what is the fifth commandment? You ready? Honor your father and mother that it may be, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Yeah, don't be afraid to speak up and say it loudly. Good job. Now, don't you find it strength, uh, very striking that the first of the commands that deal with our love of neighbor deal not with our relationship with peers or with our relationship to those under our authority, but it deals with those over us. 
it deals with our relationship to our parents. And if you think of it, the first relationship that we are born into this world with is our relationship with our parents. And you can say the most foundational rela earthly relationship that we begin life with is our relationship with our parents. It's foundational and it's foundational to any society. Phil Riken says, loving your neighbor begins at home. But this commandment, it's not just limited to home as we're going to see. It's also a call to honor all superiors that God has placed over us, whether in age or in authority. So it's, it starts in the home, but this commandment, it's not limited to the home. This commandment is, is very relevant today. And I think one reason why it's really relevant is because since the 1960s, there has been a concerted effort to rebel against all authority, especially authority in the home. Annie Gottlieb was part of the 1960s generation, a generation she describes as the generation that destroyed the American family. And she wrote, quote, We might not have been able to tear down the state, but the family was closer. We could get our hands on it. And we believed that the family was the foundation of the state. We truly believed that the family had to be torn apart to free love. And the first step was to tear ourselves free from our parents. There's a lot of chilling truth to what she says there. To tear down a nation, you need to tear down the family first. And to tear down the family, we need to disobey and dishonor our parents. And so God's command here should thunder in our collective conscience. And it should thunder to each one of us. If we would have God's blessing upon our life, then we must honor our father and our mother. Now today we're going to look at three different questions. We'll ask and answer each one of them. The first is, what does God call us to in the fifth commandment? The second one is, what's the broad application of the law? I said it's not just limited to, uh, it's not just limited to the home. There's a broader application here in the fifth commandment. Well, what is that broad application? And then the third question is the so what? What are the reasons that God gives to us that should compel us to honor our father and our mother? So let's begin with that first question. What does God call us in this fifth commandment? Well, God calls us, if you look at verse 12, he says, honor your father and your mother. Notice, God is not simply calling us to refrain from dishonoring our parents. He's calling us to positively give honor to our father and our mother. Now, the Hebrew word for honor, it's kaved, and that means heavy or weighty. Heavy or weighty. And this is the same word that the Old Testament uses to speak of the glory of God. It's the exact same word. So God's glory, you can think of it as being heavy or weighty. So to kaved our parents, to honor them, it means that we give them the, the weight that is due to them in our heart. We don't view the position that they have over us as something light, as something trivial, as something unimportant. The position that God has given them as our parents should have weight in our hearts. So what this means is the fifth commandment, it's not calling us first and foremost to actions that we do toward our parents, but it's a matter of the heart first. The position God has given your parents should be heavy in your heart. There should be a weightiness, a reverence toward your parents. Well, how does this actually work its way out? So children, I have another question for you. Here's the second question. What is taught in the fifth commandment? Ready? We are called to love and obey our parents. That's right. We're called to love and obey our parents. I think that's a great summary. And, and let's look at those two points. We'll take the second one first. So we are called to obey our parents. That's a practical way we are called to give honor to our father and mother. Keep your finger here in Exodus 20 and go over to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 6. And what I want you to notice here is notice how Paul, he ties together the call to obey our parents with the command to honor 
our father and our mother. So Ephesians 6, starting in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. So he says, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then right after that, he says, honor your father and mother. If we would honor our father and mother, then we are called to obey them in the Lord. We are called to obey them in the Lord. Now, children, what do you think that phrase means, to obey in the Lord? Well, what it means is this, is that as you obey your, obey your mommy and your daddy, as you obey your parents, you are to do it as unto the Lord Jesus Christ. One really important way that you obey Jesus and honor Jesus when you're at home under the care of your mommy and daddy is to obey your parents. If they tell you to do something, you say, yes, I'll do that. And as you're doing that, you're giving honor to Jesus Christ. Your obedience to your parents is an important way that you obey Jesus Christ. Now, you might ask children, well, how big does my obedience need to be? How big does it need to be? Well, listen to what God's Word says in Colossians chapter 3. There, God's Word says, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. So how big is your obedience to be? Obey your parents in, in everything. In everything. In everything they call you to do. Now, obviously, this does not mean that if your parents tell you to do something you shouldn't do, like maybe tell a lie, you shouldn't obey them then because you're ultimately obeying Jesus in everything you do. Obey your parents in the Lord. So if your parents tell you to do something you shouldn't do, then you have to say, Mommy and Daddy, I can't do that. But generally speaking, whatever your parents call you to do, you're called to obey. And you know what? That also includes things that you may not want to do. That's, that's when your obedience is really tested, is those things that you don't want to do. Maybe that's cleaning your room. Uh, maybe that's washing dishes. Uh, maybe that is uh, doing some kind of chore that you really just don't like at all. Uh, but even in those, especially in those things, those are the things that you are called to obey your parents. And you're called to obey with a cheerful attitude. With a cheerful attitude. Because a grumbling attitude, an attitude that says, Mom, I don't want to do that. Or why do I have to do that? Why don't you ask this person here? A grumbling attitude is a sinful attitude. So we're called to obey. One thing that I've heard is obedience is all the way, right away, with no complaining. All the way, right away, with no complaining. That's what God calls you. Obey the Lord in everything. In everything. A godly man once said, A child should be the parent's echo. A godly child should be the parent's echo. When the father and mother speaks, the child should echo back obedience. It's a good way of thinking of it. Children, you are called by God to be your parent's echo. When they, when they call you to do something, you should echo back obedience to your parents. And you know what, children? Your example in all of this is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he was here on earth, even though he was and is the Son of God, and he has all power and all authority. He had earthly parents on, on earth here. And we read of one story in Luke chapter 2 where his parents forgot him in Jerusalem. And he went to the temple and he was separated from his parents for three days as, as they were looking for him. And when his parents finally found him, they were pretty upset. And they said to him, why have you treated us so? Jesus, why have you treated us so? Now, Jesus had done nothing wrong. They, they had left him. He had done nothing wrong to them at all. But you know what? Jesus, he didn't respond with getting angry or defensive or saying, well, it's your fault. You left me here. What we read in Luke chapter 2 is this is what his response was. It says, he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. Jesus, have you thought of that, boys and girls? Jesus was submissive to his parents on earth. And if Jesus, who's the Son of God, was submissive to his parents, do you think that you are called to be submissive to your parents? Absolutely. Absolutely. Your example is Jesus Christ. 
So you're called to obey your parents. The second way we, we uh, honor our parents is to love and to respect them. Listen to Leviticus 19, chapter, 19, verse 3. It says, Every one of you shall revere his mother and father. This is an important way for us to honor our parents. It's to revere them. We should hold them in high regard. After all, it's our parents who brought us into this world. It's our parents who sacrificed for us, who provided for us, who instructed us, if we had faithful parents, who loved us. It's our parents, uh, and above all, our parents are in a God-given position of authority that he has placed them in above us. So for these reasons and more, we are called to revere our parents. Now this includes many things. Let me mention a few of them. This includes addressing our parents respectfully. Addressing our parents respectfully. I came across a young lady a few weeks ago who referred to her parents, not by mom or dad, but by their first name. That's not treating our parents respectfully. That's not addressing them respectfully. We should treat them by their position that God has given over us, mom and dad. Also, revering our parents includes speaking well of our parents. Proverbs 31 verse 28 says, her children rise up and call her blessed. So whatever good things your parents have done, we should be, we should be quick to commend them for it and to praise them for it. Revering our parents, it also shows up in small things, like in gestures or in actions. And a good example of all these things is in 1 Kings chapter 2 with King Solomon and his mother Bathsheba. In 1 Kings chapter 2, Solomon had just become king. He has all power in the nation of Israel. He could have easily been puffed up with pride. But his mom comes before him for a, a petition, for a request to ask of her son. And we read in 1 Kings chapter 2 that when his mom came in, the first thing that Solomon did, King Solomon did was he rose up from his throne. He, he stood up to honor his mother. The second thing we read is that he got down on a knee and he bowed before his mother. The third thing that he did is he refers to her as my mother. And the fourth thing that we read is he speaks graciously to her and says, what is it that you want? I'm eager to grant your request. That's a great example of revering our parents. A grown man in a position of power still revering the mother that God had given to him. And don't think that showing love and respect to your parents is only, from, only for when you're at home. Listen to Proverbs 23, verse 22. It says, Listen to your father who gave you life, and do not despise your mother when she is old. Even when your parents are old, you must show them honor. Solomon says here, Listen to your father and mother when they're old. Listen to your father and mother when they're old. It's been said before, there is no expiration date to the fifth commandment. There's no expiration date to the fifth commandment. We don't leave behind the fifth commandment when we leave home. We are always called to honor our father and mother. And Solomon here says, listen to your mother and father when they are old. Now that doesn't mean that, that when we've grown up, we've left our mother and father, we've, we've cleaved to our spouse, if God's given us a spouse, that doesn't mean that we're obligated to obey them in the same way that we are obligated to when we are under their authority. But we are obligated to receive what they have to say, to listen to them carefully, to take their input and their counsel seriously. And we see many examples of this in Scripture. One example is Ruth, with Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi. Um, Naomi came to Ruth and had a plan for a possible suitor for her, for her daughter-in-law. And, and Ruth was submissive to her mother, her mother-in-law. Uh, Ruth listened to what Naomi had to say. She took her input and counsel to heart, and she ended up doing what her mother-in-law uh, told her to do. We see this with Joseph uh, deferring to his father, Jacob, when Jacob was on uh, his deathbed at the end of his life. Jacob insisted upon giving the blessing to the younger Ephraim, Joseph's younger son Ephraim, rather than Manasseh. Joseph initially objected and said, Father, the oldest is Ephraim. You should be giving him the blessing, not uh, uh, Manasseh the blessing, not Ephraim. 
But Jacob insisted and Joseph submitted to his father, listened to his father, took his father's input to heart. And loving our parents, it also includes caring for them in old age. Now, it's very common today for people to believe that grown children bear no responsibility at all for caring for their elderly parents. But that's not true. That's not true. God's word is very clear about this. And the passage that Bob just read in Matthew 15 talks about this. In Matthew 15, you notice that as Bob was reading, that there are some of the Pharisees who were teaching and who held to that, that if you set apart certain money and said it's devoted to God, then you no longer need to be financially assisting your elderly parents in old age. You don't need to, you don't need to care for them. And Jesus, he, he lists this commandment. He lists the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. And then he says this, so for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. Jesus is saying, your way of acting very holy and saying, this money here, it's not for my parents because it's separated for God. He said, you're disobeying the fifth commandment. You're disobeying God by this. It doesn't matter how spiritual uh, you look. It doesn't matter what ex excuses you give. You have an obligation to honor your father and mother, which, which includes providing for them in old age. We are called by God with the fifth commandment to make sure that all the needs of our elderly parents are indeed being met. This is fundamentally our responsibility. It's not the government's. It's not someone else's. This is fundamentally our responsibility, making sure that all the needs of our elderly parents are indeed being met. So that's the first question is, what are we called to in the fifth commandment? The second question is, well, what is the broad application of this commandment? And I think a helpful way of summarizing this is one of the questions and answers in the Westminster Larger, Larger Catechism. Uh, in question 124, it goes, who are meant by father and mother in the fifth commandment? And the answer is this. By father and mother in the fifth commandment are meant not only natural per parents, but all superiors in age and in gifts, and especially, especially such as by God's ordinance are over us in place of authority, whether in family, church, or in commonwealth. So the answer that they give is, Honoring our father and mother includes we are called to honor all superiors. And I want to highlight two of the different categories they give. The first is all superiors in age. All who are older than us, this is part of what it means to honor our father and mother. Listen to Leviticus 19 verse 32. God's word says, You shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man, and you shall fear your God I am the Lord. You shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man. And as we do that, we are fearing the Lord and honoring him. We are not to do as our wicked culture does, and that is show less and less honor to people as they get older. This is very common. One example is the OK Boomer insult. You may have heard that. OK Boomer and it, it's an insult for the, uh, the baby boomer generation, different views that are more common in the baby boomer generation. Uh, my generation on down, there's this insult, okay boomer. Well, this, this attitude is showing disdain for that older generation. And that's not right. That, that's a violation of the fifth commandment. We must show reverence and honor to the elderly. And this includes uh, the way that we relate to them in all ways. It includes our speech. In 1 Timothy 5.1, Paul wrote to Timothy, who was a young man, young minister in Ephesus, and he says this about how he's to treat older men in the church. So listen to what God's word says in 1 Timothy 5, verse 1. It says, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Isn't that striking? You see, an older man in, in some kind of error maybe by conduct, maybe by teaching. And Paul says, Timothy, don't respond by giving him a harsh rebuke. Don't, don't respond with uh, that, that aggressive condemnation. But instead, come alongside him and encourage him, appeal to him as you would a father. So we're, we're to treat 
those that are older than us with reverence as if they were a mother or a father. So we're to honor the elderly. <clears throat> this also means that we are to honor those in rightful authority over us. Ephesians 3, 14 through 15 says this, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom all fatherhood in heaven and on earth derives its name. This is a, this is a, a passage here that has such deep, profound truth. Paul's saying all fatherhood in heaven and on earth derives its name from God the Father. God is the ultimate father. He's the archetypal father. And all fatherhood on earth here and in heaven as well, it gets its name. It derives its, its mission. It derives its authority from God the Father. And this is why the Bible calls those in positions of authority in different kind of spheres. It refers to them as fathers. For example, in 1 Samuel 24, 11, David calls King Saul, he calls him my father. Now, David wasn't Saul's son, but Saul was in a position of authority. In that position of authority, that's imitating the authority of God the Father, and David calls King Saul my father. In 2 Kings 2.12, Elisha refers to the prophet and his mentor, Elijah, as my father. Elijah was in a position of authority, and Elisha said of him, my father. We also see this in Acts 7, verse 2. Stephen, with a speech that he gave to the people of Israel, he says this to the leaders of Israel. He, he refers to them as fathers. They're fathers. They're in a position of authority. And so Stephen refers to them with respect. And there are many, many, many more examples of this in Scripture. Tim Bailey says, they're all fathers. Kings, presidents, governors, judges, police officers, mayors, principals, teachers, professors, bosses, elders, pastors, and older men. They're all to be honored as father because he each, each has been stamped with the image of the Father Almighty and is exercising authority on his behalf. Well, who in authority should we honor? What are some examples of this? Well, let me give you three briefly here. One is we should honor city fathers. And by city fathers, I mean any in civil government that are in a position of authority. We should show honor to them. Peter commands us in 1 Peter 2, verse 17, to honor the emperor. We should show honor to all those in authority in government. And this goes from the Supreme Court and the president all the way down to state senators, state representatives, even those on the local select board. We should show honor to all of them because all of them are in a position of authority. Now, one thing you might be thinking is, there are a lot of wicked politicians out there. There are a lot of um, politicians that, they're Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is describing them. They are raging against Christ and against his anointed. Are we really called to honor those politicians? And the answer is, yes, we are. Yes, we are. Which means F. Joe Biden is right out. That is not honoring those in authority. And one reason why we can confidently say this is because David honored King Saul. And King Saul was a wicked man. And he was a wicked man who wanted to kill David. And he tried to do it many, many times. And David still shows honor to the office that King Saul has. And he refers to him as my father. Now, of course, this does not mean that you are called to submit to tyranny. It does not mean that you are to follow politicians into sin. It also does not mean that you cannot condemn wicked rulers for their wicked deeds or call them to repentance. These are all things that we can do and many times we should do. But our general attitude to city fathers must be one of submissiveness and respect. This also includes church fathers. So city fathers, church fathers as well. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 13 says this. We ask you, brothers... <clears throat> to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. So here, God is calling us to respect and esteem very highly those that are over us in the church, those that are pastors in the church, those that are elders in the church, uh, even deacons in the church. We should show them honor. They're, they're the ones who preach the good news of the gospel to us. 
They're the ones who shepherd the flock of God. They're the ones who care for our souls. And, and think of what Jesus says, what is of more value than our souls? Our attitude toward them must not be one of constant fault finding, fault finding and criticism, but it must be one of appreciation and respect and honor. Another category is work fathers. Work fathers. Ephesians 6 verse 5 says this, Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. So Paul here, he's speaking of how slaves should respond to their masters. And he says they're to respond to them with fear and with a sincere heart. Now, if slaves are called to respond that way to their masters, then certainly this applies to how we respond to those in authority over us at work. This applies to our superiors, it, it, it applies to our managers, it applies to our bosses. We should respond to them with sincerity and with respect. Now, of course, all of this implies that those of us that are in positions of authority, that we do not abuse that authority, but we use it in a way that's for, that's for the benefit and blessing of those under our charge. City fathers, for example, are to protect their citizens and to be avengers of wrath on the evildoer. Church fathers are to serve and minister to God's people in the church. Work fathers are called to care for the people who work for them, who are employed uh, under their charge. And fathers and mothers at home are called not to provoke their children to anger, not to provo provoke their children to wrath, but to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So with the call to honor those authorities, there is also an application for us in authority that we're to use that authority in a way like the Lord Jesus Christ and use it for the blessing of those under our authority and not be lording it over those in our authority. Well, the third and final question I want to look at today is, so what? What, what are the reasons that God gives that should compel you to honor your father and mother and to honor all of your superiors? Let me give you two reasons. The first is this. God will certainly judge those who do not honor their parents or their superiors. God will certainly judge those who do not show honor. We'll look at this in a little bit. This commandment, it's the first one with a promise. There's a promise of reward. We'll look at this in a little bit. But this also is the first commandment with a warning as well. And this is a warning we see again and again in Scripture. Whoever does not honor their parents or superiors will certainly bring God's judgment on them. In the Old Covenant, in Leviticus 20, verse 9, God commanded that anyone who cursed his father or mother was to be put to death. Anyone who cursed his father or mother was to be put to death. Now, we're not under that Old Covenant civil code, but that principle still stands today. This is how seriously God takes dishonoring our father and our mother. Proverbs 30, verse 17. Why don't you turn over to Proverbs and look at Proverbs 30, verse 17. Proverbs is, a, is very, very vivid. It's a wonderful book. And this is, this is one of the most vivid Proverbs in all Scripture. And uh, this should get all of our attention. Proverbs 30, verse 17. It says, The eye that mocks a father and scorns to obey a mother, will be picked out by the ravens of the valley and eaten by the vultures. How's that for vivid? Now, notice the lack of honor here. This, this doesn't, we may say, this, this is not great dishonor. It's a mocking eye, it says. Like a roll of the eye. Come on, mom and dad. Or it's a scornful look, a sneer. That doesn't seem that bad, does it? And yet God says he will judge it. He says, the ravens of the valley and the vultures will eat that eye. They will pluck that eye out. Now, obviously, this is not to be taken literally. This is a very vivid description. But let me ask you, isn't it rare to see disobedient rebels prospering? Isn't it rare to see that? Do you ever see those who mock their parents being blessed in their own fellowship with their children? You don't see it. Almost never. And I think of the example of Absalom. 
Absalom was the son of King David, and Absalom was a rebel to his father. He despised his father in so many ways. He, he scorned his authority. He scorned his position over him. He, um, he sought to undermine his rule. He actually start, started a, um, a, a revolt against his father and, and took, took the throne. He slept with his father's concubines publicly for all Israel to see. And what happened to Absalom? He was trying to escape on his mule, I believe it was, and his long hair got caught in an oak tree, and he was ran through and killed. Now, that probably won't happen to you exactly, but there's a principle here. God will bring judgment on those who dishonor their father and mother. It will not go well with those who do not show honor to their father and mother. Now, you might say, you don't understand my situation because my parents have sinned and failed in so many ways. How can I be called to honor them? Well, friend, think of the example of Noah and his son, Ham. After the flood, uh, Noah with his three sons, uh, beginning life anew, in a new world as it were, and Noah planted a vineyard, and he had some wine that was cultivated from that, that vineyard, and he drank that wine, and he got drunk, and he laid naked in his own tent. Now, that's pretty shameful, getting drunk as well as being naked. Well, Ham came in. Ham, his son, came in. And what did Ham do? Rather than keeping it to himself, he went out and he told his brothers uh, Shem and Japheth. He said, brothers, you'll never guess what father did. He's drunk and he is laying naked in his own tent. Now, Shem and Japheth, when they hear this, they take a garment and they go into the tent and they go backwards as they're walking in there. And then they lay that garment over their father. But scripture says that when Noah woke up, he knew what had happened to him. He found out what his son Ham had said. And he responds by placing a curse upon Ham and upon his son Canaan. The principle here is whatever sins or failures your parents have committed, we are called not to parade them before others. Yes, deal with any serious sin that they've done. This is not an excuse to not, to not deal with any serious sin, especially if you've been wronged. But don't gossip about it before others. Focus on the good that your parents have done. Remember the position that God has placed them in, in authority over you and show honor for them if nothing else than the fact that they are your parents. We are to, to, to hide the sins of our parents, to not bring them out, not parade them out in the front, but to hide them and to show, to show honor to them. Now, final truth here is God will certainly bless those who honor their parents and superiors. So this is the, this is the positive, positive motivation. There are many good reasons to honor our father and mother. One is that they deserve to be honored. Also, it glorifies God. Paul says another reason is it's right. Obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. It's the right thing to do. But the reason God gives in the Ten Commandments is that honoring one's parents brings a great blessing to you. So why don't you turn back to Exodus chapter 12. And let's look at the final reason here. Exodus chapter 12. Uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. God's word says, Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Now, the land that's being referred to in the first place, it is the promised land. Israel is on their way to the promised land, the land that God had promised that he would give to his people. And God says that if they honored their parents, that their days would be long in the land. And, and that's not an automatic blessing, an automatic promise that those who honor their parents will live a long life. But it's a figure of speech saying, God's blessing is going to be upon you. God's blessing in every way will be upon you. And he's also saying, those that are going to dwell in the land are those who honor my parents. But those who do not honor, the implication is they'll be taken out from the land. And that's exactly what happened hundreds of years later. God's favor and blessing is upon those who honor their father and mother. And we see this promise confirmed and expanded in the new covenant in Ephesians chapter 6. There Paul says to uh, believers in Christ in Ephesus, he says, Honor your father and mother, this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. 
Now, brothers and sisters, Ephesus, which is where Paul is writing, these believers in Ephesus, Ephesus is not anywhere near Jerusalem. It's not anywhere near Jerusalem. It's not anywhere near the Old Covenant promised land. And yet Paul says, this promise in the Old Covenant, this promise, believers in Jesus Christ, it's for you. Even Gentile believers, it's for you. And Paul's point here is saying, the promised land is not just limited to what God had said in the Old Covenant. It now expands everywhere on the globe. It includes Ephesus, and it includes everywhere. And think of what Jesus Christ said. The meek shall inherit what? It's the earth. It's not just Palestine. It's not just Old Covenant promised land. It's the whole earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and the Lord has promised to give the earth to his people. Well, who are the ones that will dwell on the earth? Who are the ones that will enjoy, enjoy long days on the earth? Who are the ones that will enjoy God's blessing on this earth? It's those who honor their father and mother. If you want to be blessed by God, if you want to be honored by God, if you want God's favor to be upon you, then honor your father and mother. Let's pray. Father, I pray that we would not be conformed to this world that shows very little honor at all to our mother and father or any superiors. But I pray, Father, that we would be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Father, in the ways that we have fallen short, in the ways that we have not obeyed, obeyed your word, we come before you humbly and with meekness and with repentance. And we pray, Father, that you'd forgive us on account of the blood of Christ, that you'd cleanse us, that you'd empower us to walk in obedience in honoring our father and mother. We thank you, Father. We praise in Jesus' name. Amen.